Hi everyone, Shlichim prepare for their important mission, a journey in search of China's last Jews. New website promotes celebrating bar and bat mitzvahs in Jerusalem, the third nefesh ben nefesh summer flight, rabbis ascend to the Temple Mount, and music by the Yud Band. Whoa, that's a lot. Let's get started. Shalom and welcome to Israeli Salad. Shaliach is Hebrew for emissary. This term is well known in Chabad as the last Lubavitcher Rebbe founded a network of emissaries that are dispersed throughout the globe spreading Torah and Judaism. Many organizations in Israel also send shlichim abroad. We met the religious Zionist shlichim that are teaching Jews about the connection between the land, the Torah, and the nation. Shlichut <laughs> means going to a foreign country to learn a bit about another culture. Of Jews who don't live in Israel, it means bringing a Jewish spirit, an Israeli spirit there, to introduce them to B'nai Akiva, everything that exists in Israel but not there. A day-long seminar for religious Zionists who are going on shlichut, being sent to communities abroad, took place recently in Jerusalem. Around 300 emissaries under the auspices of the Jewish Agency and B'nai Akiva, B'nai Ami and Torah Mitzion organizations met to ask, learn, and prepare together for this important task. I think it's very important for us to have shtichim in all these places. The importance is really to send shtichim to every single place that we can. Any place that will take us, that it, the, the conditions are good, we'll send shtichim, because it's important for us to show what Israel really is. Ideally, the idea is to boldly tell them that every Jew belongs in Israel, but that's not so realistic today. But there's also the goal of bringing them on trips to Israel, teaching them about life here, that it's not like what they see on television in all of these places. Basically to show them what an Israeli is. We go around with them, we live with them, we speak with them. B'nai Akiva is an organization which primarily addresses youth. B'nai Akiva have a very specific target audience, a defined population. This population is easiest to work with, they're relatively fresh, unripe, flexible. They absorb what you give them. They aren't heads of households. Their connection to their place of residence is only a function of where their family is. If it's possible to accomplish anything, to get a group to make Aliyah together, not as individuals, this is the group. Even though people who know Israel and they go and they tour Israel, places like New York or Miami, they know what Israel is, but we feel like show, we're going to show them what Israel really is, who the people are in Israel, and, and I think it's very important for all of your communities, any place in the world, to come and take shtichim, uh, which will do any work you want, they'll work in schools, they'll work in youth movements, they'll do anything possible. We work with families more when they host us for Shabbat. Each Shabbat, we're hosted by at least two families. We talk politics, Judaism, holidays, etc. around the Shabbos table. For the kids, we run Shabbat and weekday activities that they attend. I will work primarily in the school, hanging out with the kids, arranging activities, talking and setting up Torah study partners. The main thing is just to be there. On Shabbat and Sunday, we'll make activities and engage them. They become active in B'nai Akiva, Zionism, Aliyah, and more. Past and current emissaries participated in the seminar. They gave the incoming shlichim the opportunity to hear first-person accounts of the shlichut experience. Um, I returned from my shlichut in Miami Beach, Florida, just three days ago. It was a 10-month shlichut. I came today to contribute some of the information that I accumulated in my experiences during the year abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, 
You were not born in Belgium or Copenhagen or New Zealand. You don't know your way around. Don't be shy. If your mouth is shy, you'll ruin your legs. I try to help this group hit the ground running and start working right away while they're still getting acclimated, which takes time. I help them to broadcast right away that they're serious about their jobs, which gives the entire movement a reputation for seriousness, that they don't just go out on a shlichut, but that they're willing to give it their all and also do things well. During the shlichut, the community sees the shaliach as a representative figure of all of Israel. Therefore, his behavior, values, and answers to all the questions that people ask about Israel are very important for his success. In truth, I ran into a whole bunch of really hard questions, and I didn't always have answers. For example, how can it be that there was not sufficient provisions for the soldiers during the Second Lebanon War? We gave money. Where did it go? I answered, you're right, it was a failure. But in Israel, like in any other country, there are failures and there are successes. You need to learn how to focus on the positive, and there's a lot of positive. During the seminar, the Shlichim also had the opportunity to meet some success stories from past emissaries. I grew up in Cleveland, was active in Bnei Akiva. I spent a year in Hachshara in Kibbutz Yavne, and after that, returned to Cleveland in order to be active in Bnei Akiva. After that, joined the Garin Aliyah, and today with my friends live in Kibbutz Rosh Tzurim in Gush Etzion. There's no question that Bnei Akiva impacts on people's lives, makes a di difference in people's lives, and it's because of Bnei Akiva that people make Aliyah to Israel. And how do they cope with their longings for home? Hey, no you don't cope, especially if you have a family, kids. It's part of the sacrifice. It's hard. You cry a lot. You keep in touch with home. Thank God there are many ways to keep in touch. Instant messenger, Skype, there's no shortage. The connection to the country, to life here, to family, between grandparents and grandchildren, it's hard. Definitely not easy. So let's wish lots of success to these shlichim in their mission to kindle souls and bring fellow Jews closer to our people, to the Torah, and to the land. Anyone who has the desire and ability and really wants to work for God's sake and is qualified should go on shlichut. You need to go in with an open mind, without prejudice, without skepticism. Give what you have to give and also receive. Need shlichim. There's no substitute for shlichim. I see it as a continuation of my army service where I was an officer. This is another step toward what I want to do with my whole life, which is to help the Jewish people in any way I can, whether in Israel or abroad, to open their eyes toward Israel. According to history, Jews reached China in three waves of migration from Persia, Iraq, and Europe. Today there are hardly any Jews in China. Our correspondent, Kobe Finkler, found one Jewish family. We now join him on his journey in search of China's last Jews. A 10-hour flight from Israel brings us to our destination as we search for the remnants of Jewish lineage that remain in the world's most populous country, China. There's one Jewish family currently residing in all of China. In order to find the Jews, the remnants of a cultural existence which once flourished here, we must embark on a deep and broad journey. China, 5767, is still communist. Tourists are not allowed to travel alone. All of our travels must be with a local guide and with local transportation to take you to destinations which have been pre-approved by authorities. So in order to get the, the last Jewish family living in Kaiping, in southern China, one must travel past exciting scenes of rice and garlic fields, through ancient cultures, and to search after everything that was once here, some of which is no longer. Jews live, or more precisely lived, in two cities of the gigantic country, Kaiping and Shanghai, 
In the city of Kaiping, in a nondescript ground floor two room apartment, lives a family which has a tradition that they are Jewish. Religious symbols can be seen in every part of the small apartment. Pictures of rabbis, mezuzot, Hanukkah menorahs, nit kipot, and even a bin of Hebrew from the local guide. My name is Tzur. I'm a descendant of Jews from Kaifeng. Welcome. How do you know that you are Jewish? My grandfather and grandmother told me that I'm Jewish. Do you keep Jewish customs? I know. All of the other descendants of Jews in Kaifeng know that we're Jewish. The only descendants of Chinese Jews are in Kaifeng. There are Jews in Shanghai, Beijing, and Hong Kong, but they're not Chinese. We are Chinese Jews. The group was able to visit the apartment only by coordinating in advance. Only after they were accepted by them, they were able to visit the family's burial plot where generations of family members are buried according to their profession and according to the year they died. This describes the different eras of the family. For example, in the year 1489, they started chronicling the family tree. In 1942, there was a terrible famine here. Every date signifies something connected to the city and to the family. Oil Moshe, the last remaining synagogue in Shanghai, is currently undergoing renovations. In the middle of the main street of this gigantic city, there is a sign guiding visitors towards the synagogue. The Chinese value the preservation of historical sites. In the center of Kaiping, our guide brings us to the courtyard where the local hospital now stands. This was once part of the area where the Jews would gather to study Torah. That's also the name of the place. The name of the street is Torah Study Way South. The signs remain. A synagogue that was twice destroyed by flooding rivers once stood here. The first time, community members donated their resources to build it. 200 years later, another flood destroyed the synagogue. There was not enough money to rebuild it. The community's last rabbi died in 1867. Portraits of the synagogue can be found in the local museum. A steel silently carries the history of the Kaipeng Jewish community. From what was, all that remains is a water well, which also used to serve as a mikveh. Since Mao's revolution in 1949, Judaism does not appear on the official list of recognized religions. They are not able to convert to Judaism. It's forbidden in China. In Hutong, one of China's many poor urban neighborhoods, the group walks through the alleyways, and one of these hovels lives the widow of the last Jew in the neighborhood. She's 88 years old and lives a life of struggle. There are Jewish symbols in her house. She does not speak Hebrew, and it's difficult to make conversation with her. Her entire living space is just 20 square meters. Everything is in there, her kitchen, bedroom, and oven for preparing rice noodles. Her clothes hang from a line outside. That's all the space she has. It's like this throughout the country. Two hours by plane and the group arrives in Shanghai, the largest city in the world. This city started as a fisherman's town and is now home to 17 million people. The Jewish ghetto is in the center of the city. Beyond the ghetto walls and a public garden is a memorial to the area's Jews. This is a study to memorize the refugee uh, in the Second World War from Europe to uh, Shanghai. And this symbolizes the friendship between Shanghai and the Jewish people. At the corner is the Ohel Moshe Synagogue. Two Sephardic synagogues and one Ashkenazi. In earlier times there were as many as 11 synagogues in Shanghai. It is the very famous synagogue, the Jewish synagogue. So I think that's why you come here. You Are you a Jewish or you? Yeah, here yes. we are. From Jerusalem. Yeah. Reunite. You, you. From Jerusalem. Oh, from the, oh, I see, that's a very Only famous city. city. Why very originally there were four synagogues in Shanghai, yes. two by Safadi and two, two by Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi. Now leaves two, one each. This is Ashkenazi? This is a small one, uh, Ash Ashkenazi. This is Ashkenazi, and another Sassoon one built the Safadi. Uh, okay. uh, is it uh, open It's that? quite a bit, but uh, commonly not open to the top. It seems that the Great Wall of China, which stretches for 6,000 kilometers, symbolizes the lives of the last remaining Jews of China. 
The wall closes everything off, including these isolated Jews. It is doubtful they will ever reach the land of Israel. The members of China's last Jewish family remain unaware of the need to make Aliyah. Even if they wanted to, they would not necessarily be able to. Either way, this is the story of China's last Jewish family. Jews in China. Last week we saw the Sivuv Sharim event, a marching around the Temple Mount expressing our longing for the Holy Temple. Now let's join a group of rabbis who actually ascended to the Temple Mount itself. <laughs> What the Ishmaelites have done here is simply take control of the underground platform and turn it into one giant mosque. They say it's the largest in the Middle East. A few months have passed since a group of national religious rabbis ascended to the Temple Mount to near the location where the temple actually stood. Video footage from the mount has only been recently approved for release. As we noted before, the police originally approved the celebratory ascent as part of the festivities marking the 40th anniversary of Jerusalem's reunification. However, they stipulated that photos and particularly video footage of the seminal event would remain classified for a certain period, in order that feelings that the ascent generated would cool off. The day after the ascent on INN TV, we featured the reactions of participating rabbis to their unique experience. Now. We bring you footage from the Temple Mount itself. The usual rules apply. No liturgy, no bowing, no singing, no praying, no nothing. Any ambiguous action, an action which can be construed in this way, is problematic and we will escort you from the site. That's all. Have a good day and enjoy. At first, the rabbis undergo a security check at the entrance to the western wall. They leave their leather shoes there. After instructions like the ones we got here, you can feel the shame and the difficulty. On the other hand, we, a group of rabbis, to ascend in honor of the 40th anniversary of Jerusalem's liberation, we must thank God for making this possible and continue to hope for more. Later, they pray quietly and hear explanations at the Mugrabi Gate. The tour around the places permissible to walk takes approximately 90 minutes. The march is permitted by the authorities, but prayer is definitely prohibited for Jews. That's why the participants move from place to place while listening to if a only we would merit lecture. to truly be awakened to redeem this place, or at least to return it to the sovereignty of the Jewish people. It's important to remember that the city was to the south of the Temple Mount, not to the west like it is today. It was to the south, where the city of David is now. During the tour, police arrested three Arab photographers who were documenting the rabbi's visit. Witnesses said that their equipment was confiscated. There, in an entrance here to an underground structure in which, as the prophet says, the foxes will trod. The story is that, as many of you know, the entire southwestern part of the Temple Mount is built over massive underground vaults was included in the mount as part of Herod's expansion. So there are these huge empty subterranean chambers which many people call Solomon's stables, an expression which apparently originates with the Crusaders. The staff which escorts the rabbis zealously makes sure that none of the rabbis murmur any prayers, but facing the location of the temple itself, the group stops and the words pour out by themselves. 
At the end of the tour, the rabbis dance emotionally on the other side of the massive wooden doors. I would say that this has national significance. Let the public see and hear that rabbis ascend to this place. It can inspire the public to ascend too. The question of ascending to the Temple Mount is far from decided. There are great Jewish legal or halachic authorities on either side of the issue. Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu told Arutz Sheva that he thinks that a synagogue should be built on the Temple Mount in a place that would be okay according to all halachic opinions. Rabbi Lior already has the place picked out. This could be a great location for a synagogue. There's no halachic problem to turn a mosque into a synagogue. Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu agrees that the status quo cannot continue. We all desire to ascend the mount. The fact that we're not there due to technical problems should not be constructed as a sign of indifference. However, the current Sephardic chief rabbi opposes ascent to the Temple Mount. The question has now returned to the rabbi's desks. Forty years have passed and it seems that a heart to understand, eyes to see, and ears to hear develop only after 40 years after the eyes, ears, and heart are opened. A bar or bat mitzvah, when a boy reaches the age of 13 and a girl the age of 12, is a time when a Jew becomes an adult. What better place to celebrate this occasion than the Jewish capital of the land of Israel, Jerusalem. Shalom to Eli Nachmias, Director of Overseas Marketing in the Jerusalem Municipality. Hi, Shalom Yoni. So, you're now launching a website that will hopefully bring more families to Jerusalem for the Bar Bat Mitzvah celebrations. Tell us please about this site. Uh, our uh, Bar Mitzvah site, created by the Ministry of Tourism, the Municipality of Jerusalem Tourism Authority and the Jerusalem Hotel Association is the ultimate site for bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. It's a one-stop uh, shop. You can find in it everything you want to know about bar mitzvah, from organizing the ceremony, from sites, hotels, everything is in there. For our viewers who have never been to Jerusalem, what would you say is unique about the city and celebrating such an important event in Jerusalem? When you come to Jerusalem uh, for a bar mitzvah, uh, you become a link uh, in the Jewish history, in the heart of the Jewish history, in Jerusalem, which is the center of the Jewish nation, uh, of the Jewish people all over the world. So the bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, boy or girl that come here, connect with their own history, connect physically and more meaningful than that, connect spiritually. Ellie, we're already past half of the summer vacation. How's the tourism situation in Jerusalem these days? As everybody can see when you walk in the streets of Jerusalem and in the, all the sites in all uh, the land of Israel, we have tourists from all over the world, from North America, from the United States, from every corner of the, the world coming. And we're very, very happy about it and we hope that it will continue like that. Ellie, before we say goodbye, I'd like to use the opportunity that you're standing at the Jerusalem's municipality, Safra Square. Tell us, please, about the artistic exhibition behind you. We're standing at uh, Kikar Safra, where we have 133 uh, sculptures of bears, which symbolize uh, tolerance and working together and friendship towards each other. The 132 bears were painted by painters from 133 countries, member of the United Nations. It's an exhibition that is a, going from a capital to capital city in the world, and it started in 2002 in Berlin, and today it's in Jerusalem, and from here it's going to Ethiopia and Egypt after all. Eli Nachmias, Jerusalem Municipality, thank you very much for joining us. You are most welcome, and we're 
expecting all the bar and bat mitzvahs to come to Jerusalem. We are waiting to welcome them here in Jerusalem. Thank you. Coming to Israel is great. Coming to celebrate a bar or bat mitzvah here is even greater. But the greatest is, of course, making Aliyah, immigrating to Israel. Aaron Deutsch met this summer's third Nefesh B'Nefesh plane that brought Morolim to their homeland. Another Nefesh B'Nefesh flight and another plane load of Jews return home. They came from across America, but they all have one thing in common. They have all returned to the land of Israel. We're making Aliyah, fulfilling a lifelong, a lifelong dream. It is really a dream come true. We've been planning for five years. And we've done it, and we're just so excited to have you be here. Some new Olim had more stops than others before returning to the Jewish homeland. By way of Jerusalem, Hodesharon, Toronto, Los Angeles, Hodesharon, and back. <laughs> we're from New York and we lived in Cincinnati for a year. And we went back to New York and now we're here. While coming home to Israel is always exciting, one new Ole had a slightly less exciting flight to Israel this time, despite coming on Aliyah. Well, the last landing we were flanked by fighter jets on Continental Flight 90 the day after Pesach ended. And um, it was about the scariest experience I've ever had. And this was a much more pleasant one. Everyone singing, landing calmly and happily. Crowds of well-wishers were there to welcome the new Olim to Israel. Among the dignitaries there to greet the new Olim was former Prime Minister and current opposition leader Benjamin Netanyahu. Leaders of Nefesh B'Nefesh welcomed the Olim to their new home in Israel. And Rabbi Fass, founder of Nevesh Benefesh, assured us this was only the beginning. We had 210 Olim who arrived this morning. Um, very beautiful variety of individuals, but what was special about this flight is that we had 30 young men and women who were going straight into the IDF, which was uh, the highest number that we've ever had on one flight. Throughout the entire summer, probably be close to 2,200, probably close to 2,200 Olim altogether for the summer. So we've had close to five, 700 people. So we have a lot more to go. We have a bunch more flights. Again, welcome to Israel. Okay, that was Israeli Salad 159. We'll be back next week. One of our features will be with the Yud Band. We'll end today's program with one of their songs. So join us again next time. Until then, from all of us here, Shalom. second chances and I believe there's a road leading home and I can see there's nothing just by chance here and I believe yes I believe that the times they are a changing and i believe that the writing's on the wall and i can see the skies are rearranging and i believe
I believe like the river's flowing waters I believe where the oceans reach the sky I believe that love it has no borders and in you and I I believe I believe Yeah. <laughs> 